Good afternoon. I am Jackie Malay, honored to serve as mayor of the city of Lone Tree in Colorado. I'm thrilled to have the opportunity to discuss something that I'm very passionate about, transportation solutions. The Denver Metro region has achieved tremendous success when we've worked collectively to solve transportation problems. And I think the first uh, thing we have done is really come from a bottom-up approach to really talk at the local level first about what we're trying to accomplish and then rolling up that up to a larger regional plan. I think the uh, project that's pointed to with greatest success was the 2004 Fast Tracks where really the Metro Mayor's Caucus, the regional mayors, got together and really were the spokespersons for that project, going out, talking in lo their local communities to the PTOs, to the chambers, to the EDPs, and to residents and HOA meetings about the importance of solving the regional problem through the light rail solution. While the city of Lone Tree is thrilled to have light rail access, we recognize it's not the full solution. Some of our larger employers are not located directly next to our light rail station. So we developed a partnership with uh, the largest employers, Charles Schwab, Skyridge Medical Center, and then Park Ridge Omni Park Metro District to fund a fixed route shuttle system, which it's takes folks from the light rail station out to the employee sites, uh, 10 minute uh, round trip service from the light rail. It provides safe, flexible, reliable transportation for their employees and it gets cars off the roads in the city of Lone Tree, which is very important to the residents here. Lone Tree's Link On Demand, powered by Uber, is really an ingenious, first of the kind pilot in the country. The city, through partnership with our major employers, has funded this free on-demand service to our residents. Um, you access it through the Uber app on your phone. If your origin and destination is within the city of Lone Tree, this, this link option will show up. Um, we have found it tremendous widespread use from a broad range of our constituents, whether it be seniors trying to get access to medical services or retail at our mall, uh, the tweens visiting friends, neighbors, bowling alleys, restaurants, or employers who have, excuse me, employees who have come down on light rail but then want to access shopping, retail, uh, medical appointments during their lunch hour or before or after they start working. Um, we have been thrilled with the reception, over 10,000 riders to date, and we believe we'd more than double that ridership if we actually had two shuttles out at the time, and that is something we're exploring right now. The city of Lone Tree is a growing community. Our business community is growing, as is our residential population. And while we are thrilled to welcome new businesses, retail, and people to the community, we recognize it brings additional traffic and congestion. In order to achieve the quality of our life that our residents have come to expect, the city of Lone Tree is really proud to be investing in an all of the above transportation solution. We've made investments in additional bike lanes. We've made investments in a pedestrian bridge over a very busy arterial where thrilled to be investing in light rail. We've also expanded the use of shuttle service in our community and provided a free on-demand uh, link service, shuttle service with in partnership with Uber. We feel like this really will provide the best options for the people and also attract new businesses to come here. We, uh, we had a chance to meet with Mayor Jackie Malay on our last Williamson Ford trip last year to Denver. She's the mayor of Lone Tree. Lone Tree is a suburb just like uh, Williamson County is to Denver. And we were really impressed by her drive, her professionalism, and just the way she approached transportation solutions in Lone Tree, working with the public and private sector. So um, we wanted to show you um, that to start this, uh, this conversation. Welcome to, uh, as you'll learn, our overly ambitious fourth annual transportation summit. My name is Matt Largen with Williamson Inc. and I'll be your moderator for the conversation today. We started this journey four years ago when uh, the county mayor's office actually hosted the first summit and then we volunteered to continue this effort to work towards advancing the ball on finding solutions that reduce traffic congestion and improve circulation in Williamson County.
And as you can see by the video earlier, the benefits of the trips that we take as an organization extend far beyond when our plane lands back at Nashville International. Learning from and developing a relationship with other communities in the country uh, that are model regions are critical to solving challenges in our own community. We have our third Williamson Ford coming up in early October to the Washington DC region where we'll have a lot of conversations about how that area is managing growth. If um, you're interested in joining us, please, please see one of our team members after this meeting. Nissan has been our partner and sponsor for the last three years for this event, and we greatly appreciate their support and everything they do in our community. It's my pleasure to introduce to you Chris Keefe. He's the Senior Manager of Corporate Communications at Nissan. Chris. Uh, thank you, Matt, for the very warm introduction. Hi, folks. As introduced, my name is Chris Keefe. I'm from the corporate communications team at Nissan. And I'm pleased to be here to represent the company today. Uh, our 1,800 employees who are at the HQ, which is just down the road, as most of you all know. Um, you may not know that we have about 8,500 employees at our Smyrna vehicle assembly and our battery plant. So we. Uh, we have a fairly large footprint here in Williamson County and the surrounding counties. And we're really proud of the role that our business and our employees play in the development of the community where we all live and work. So I wanted to start my words today with three quick points to answer some of the questions that you're gonna be addressing today. Um, especially regarding the impact on the transportation network and how we can help reduce traffic congestion in the area. One of them is our fairly robust um, HR policies which enable our employees to choose the time when they come to work and when they leave to work. Telecommuting and working from home. They're very supportive of that and it seems to be working well and reducing some of the crunch around uh, when people are leaving and reducing some of the congestion on the roads. Now flex time is essentially where we have eight hours of work but the employee can choose when he or she comes to the office and when she leaves. So again, it helps reduce some of the crush around um, peak times. And the third point I wanted to mention was our support uh, for Hitch. Nissan's the first automaker to the back the innovative app uh, by Hitch Rewards, which was launched earlier this year. I think you'll be able to see more information about that outside. Um, it's essentially incentivized ride sharing, but we think that Hitch will help reduce uh, traffic congestion and reduce some of the carbon emissions by enabling users to share rides using their personal vehicles. And we think that's a competitive advantage. It enables a better understanding for us of consumer behavior as more people embrace new forms of mobility like carpooling or car sharing. Oops. So I'd like to raise one or two things about our corporate vision, which is zero emissions and zero fatalities, essentially helping to reduce the amount of CO2 we put into the atmosphere and also making our cars safer for folks on the road. And as part of that, I would be remiss if I did not mention the fact that we're the global leader in EVs. We've sold 330,000 EVs around the world, 120,000 of those here in the States. It's something that we're trying to promote very aggressively because we think it's good for communities and good for the planet. This is part of our Nissan Intelligent Mobility. Now, what is that? Well, it's our approach to changing how cars are powered, driven, and integrated into society. Some of these developments that we're gonna, I'm gonna be talking about for the next couple of minutes are not just the distant future, but it's also happening right now in the vehicles that we're driving today. Essentially, what I want to, one thing I want to convey is that at Nissan, we see these new technologies operating together as part of the larger Nissan Intelligent Mobility vision to move people to a better world, including the folks right here in Williamson County. So we think the LEAF is the embodiment of Nissan Intelligent Mobility, and also that the business community, local and state authorities, really need to work together as a society handles growth and the new technologies that are shaping the way that people are getting from point A to point B. Now, as you're eating, I'd like you to just take a second to imagine something. I'm talking about the near future, but imagine 100% electric cars that recharge themselves while you're sleeping where the batteries in the cars can deliver enough energy to potentially power your home, or in the unfortunate event if the power grid goes down, can give back to the power grid. 
where autonomous zero emission driving makes it safer and protects the quality of our air. So where connected vehicles in cities make traffic congestion a thing of the past, which is one of the things y'all are gonna be talking about today, despite growing urbanizing population. So these are some of the things that we're working toward at Nissan North America. Now, this slide is ProPilot Assist, which I understand some of you may have heard last year, so I will basically just gush a little bit about it because I drove it recently myself. And it's one of our advanced driving systems on the road towards autonomous driving. In other words, it is not a fully autonomous feature, but it's a hands-on, eyes-on thing that helps a vehicle. Um, some of our vehicles that are on the road right now, including the Nissan Leaf, the Nissan Rogue, and soon in the Nissan Altima, which is gonna be launched later this fall. And it basically reduces the driver's workload in heavy highway traffic and during long commutes. It's a really, really interesting technology. I won't go any further because we have limited time, but I encourage you all to think about it, and if you have a chance, consider it. Now, the last um, pillar of Nissan Intelligent <clears throat> Mobility that I wanted to talk about, which is integration, and it's thinking beyond vehicles themselves, but how we can use them to integrate with society through connectivity to make our lives and our society better. And this is some of the things that we're also deeply considering here at Nissan North America. Finally, autonomous vehicles, vehicles that ostensibly will drive themselves. Again, imagine a car, you have a business trip and you need to go to the, the airport. Imagine a car that could drive you to the airport, drive itself home, and then pick you up when you arrive back. All the while, its connectivity would reduce travel time, minimize traffic congestion, and improve energy management, and give power back to the grid. This is very long-term future things, um, but it's something that is not beyond the pale. It's something that we'll all see within the next 10 years or so, not just with Nissan, but with some other automakers as well, obviously. But this is the kind of exciting technology that we see not only now in cars, but also, uh, sorry, the advanced driving systems that we see now, which are leading to fully autonomous vehicles in the future, which are going to dramatically change the world and the community that we live in. So, in sum, we're excited about where Nissan Intelligent Mobility is today, but we're even more excited about the impact that it's going to have on mobility here in the coming years. So as Williamson County continues to thrive, develop, and grow, Nissan North America will be there growing and changing with it. Thank you very much for your attention. Chris, and thanks uh, everything that Nissan does for our community when it comes to um, finding solutions, both um, from a technology standpoint, but also, and we'll get into this later, about what that means from flex schedule, remote working, all sorts of different avenues to help reduce traffic and congestion in Williams County, Middle Tennessee. So, no surprise to anybody in this room, we know Williams, we know the national region will continue to grow. In fact. Williamson County is expected to double in population by 2040. We also know what happens when you don't plan for growth. Um, as we learned in Austin, our first Williamson Ford trip, now three years ago, you get traffic and you get a lot of it, especially in a city like Austin that made a conscious decision not to build out infrastructure and they're still paying for that um, decision they made 20 years later. We also had a chance to hear from Denver on our second Williamson Ford trip last year. And uh, we got a chance to learn how they leverage investment from the federal government and also how they plan and campaign as a region for regional transportation solution. So at this time, I'd like to introduce the first panel of our session, Now What? Um, our guests to this panel are Steve Bland. He's the CEO of the National Metropolitan Transit Authority and the Regional Transportation Authority. And Michael Skipper, the Executive Director of the Greater Nashville Regional Council. Thank you both, gentlemen, for joining me today. So one of the things that, that should be on. One of the things that we, uh, get your picture, Michael? Good, okay, good, got it. One of the uh, things that we talked about when we marketed this conversation today in this Transformation Summit is uh, really now what? You know, what do we do? But before we talk about that, I'd love to hear from both of you with the first question. What do you think is the number one lesson that we learned from the recent transit vote in Nashville? 
Either one. Yeah, I'll take that first. But before I do, I want to thank you for inviting me to the uh, to the event today. I'm always excited to talk about transportation with a room full of folks. Um, I'm passionate about the issue, uh, but I'm so impressed uh, that you're all here uh, to talk about it with us. I get paid to do this for a living, um, and it's always impressive when people volunteer their time to come together to solve big community issues. I also want to commend you, Matt, and your staff for diving so deeply into public policy as a chamber, leveraging uh, the resource you have in this room to make things happen on the political level. Um, as far as the uh, ballot initiative in Nashville, um, and I'll have to say it's certainly an unfortunate setback in terms of the schedule for implementing transit regionally, uh, but it comes not unexpected and not entirely without value. Mm -hmm. um, you know, these things are difficult to do the first time. Uh, it's true when you look across the country, about 70% of ballot initiatives related to transportation investments across the country tend to be approved by voters on an annual basis. Um, but when you look inside those numbers, it's not uncommon for the first try uh, to be a defeat at the, the ballot box. Um, but like I said, it doesn't come without value. Uh, with that, you get um, an unprecedented level of public awareness about the issue and the options, the amount of funding it takes to implement solutions for transportation. And uh, for the first time, really, beyond a planning process, you get um, voters and the general population um, uh, to consider putting skin in the game, uh, and the conversation becomes a little bit more meaningful. So I'd say it's a setback, but not without tremendous value. In terms of the lessons learned, um, really, we could Monday morning quarterback this to death. Um, but two recurring themes that resonated with me that we need to do a better job with, and that is to better integrate the role of technology uh, into our proposal, um, and to do a better job of communicating how what any one of our communities do on this issue will affect regional outcomes. Right. Steve. First of all, if you have to limit me to one, that's going to be really tricky, Matt. Um, I'd we probably echo one of the things that Michael said and, and summarize it this way. This is really hard. Uh, it's not simple to do, and I think when folks try to oversimplify it, there's a challenge in that. Through the course of the Let's Move Nashville initiative, I probably did 50 or 60 neighborhood meetings, community meetings, and the one thing I know a lesson is don't think you can put transportation in a bubble and isolate it from other community right. issues. We heard everything from gentrification, affordable housing, you know, you name it, um, Nashville schools, uh, community spending priorities, what have you. So the idea that we can say, well, it's a transportation initiative, we can lock it away and kind of leave the other stuff out, you know, I think is, is a little bit naive and certainly a lesson I think that we should take away from it. Yeah, I, I mean, I think, you know, from our standpoint, these, all these different issues, whether it's transportation, attainable housing, growth, um, connectivity, they're all interrelated now. And transportation is not just a transportation issue, it's an economic development issue. So let me follow on as, on the path of that first question and say, how, now that we have this chance to do this again, how do you include all the voices at the table early on and make sure that, that we, we have a chance to, uh, to, to take into account everybody's sort of perspective and view on this. Because ultimately, these are the people that are gonna, gonna use the system and promote the system long term. Well, I'll start off and say, and again, I'll echo something Michael said, that a positive out of it is every time you make an effort at this, whether it was the AMP in Nashville several years ago, the in motion process that the RTA and the MTA underwent, the MPO's regional planning process, Nashville's ballot initiative, more and more people get engaged in that conversation and more and more viewpoints come out where I'd say historically, when you did a typical transportation planning process, you got the same 20 or 25 people um, sitting around a table. So I think it's events like this one, it's uh, organizations like yours being hyper involved and expanding out to other organizations. You know, I see Carol in the room. We're yep. pleased to partner with uh, Cumberland Region Tomorrow, the Transit Alliance of Middle Tennessee, Joanne, um, extending that reach even further into our community. So that you track down as many people as you can find. And again, you can't restrict that conversation to just their transportation concerns. Because what we're really talking about in Middle Tennessee is fundamentally some changes in the way we live. Uh, and we heard that quite a bit in Nashville too. It wasn't so much, well I oppose a transit improvement or transportation improvement, 
but I'm very concerned about what might happen to my neighborhood right. if this comes about. Yeah. Okay. You want to add on anything? Yeah, I think I will. I mean, I think it's a really difficult question to answer uh, simply. Mm -hmm. um, I think a public engagement is not uh, sort of a one-time effort before you do something big. It's really yep. a continuum. Uh, and you have to understand what people want to be engaged with. Some people don't care about the long-range planning. They just want to know that you've got a solution and you're going to move forward with it. A lot of times when we come up against these major milestones along this timeline for implementation, like a ballot initiative, people think that this is the, the only time that there's an opportunity to engage. When the reality is there's been, you know, leading up to the Let's Move Nashville initiative, uh, you had 20, 30 years of planning around transit and the planning is not going to cease to happen or the community engagement is not going to cease to happen uh, regardless of the outcome of the vote. I mean, some people are more interested in um, once the money is approved and you begin to implement the solution, they want to shape what the growth and development is going to be to look like around the station. They're going to want to be involved in engineering level questions about um, how it's going to impact daily op operations along roadways, uh, how it's going to look uh, physically and architecturally. Yeah. And they're going to be able to solve or answer all those questions or have all those conversations at one moment in time. So people have to have confidence. We've got to convey uh, this to folks that there's multiple points to be engaged um, even after major decisions are made along that continuum. Right. Well, let me, let me follow up to Michael specifically and then I'll go back to you, Steve. But how, with, to talk about the limitations of Tennessee law about either, whether it's planning or funding regionally and how that looks, because one of the things we heard often too is how does this plan, and you all reference it, affect the entire region and include the entire region? So talk about that the next time we do this. How do you make sure this is truly a regional effort like what we learned in Denver last year? Well, you know, I think, you know, one of the things we heard a lot was that Let's Move Nashville wasn't regional. Um, factually speaking, which sometimes doesn't matter uh, in every context. It, Let's Move Nashville was a program of projects selected by stakeholders within Davidson County that was pulled from a regional transit plan that was adopted by the Regional Transportation Authority Board of Directors, which uh, represents communities across 10 counties. And so it's a subset of that regional plan. So I think this was regional. Um, the limitation I think we found was in the funding mechanism and that the funding mechanism that was uh, provided to us by the state legislature, and by the way, I don't want to take a negative bent to this question. It's tremendous that the legislature back in 2016 included in the IMPROVE Act um, the ability for counties and their municipalities to work together to go to the voters for funding. Um, but the fact that we'd have to build the system county by county because that's the way the funding mechanism was put into the law uh, is a challenge. It, it, more so just to communicate to people, convince them or give them confidence that um, if we begin the investment in Davidson County that it will eventually be expanded regionally through subsequent decision making. Right. Um, and the reality here is that that's really the most common approach to building regional transit across the, across the country. If you mm -hmm. think of Salt Lake City and, and the Twin Cities of Minneapolis, these are great regional systems that rely on decisions to be made uh, at the county level. And they just have to work it out the best they can. Having said that, I think there is an opportunity to go back to the legislature with this challenge of regional implementation mm -hmm. and move our local model of financing towards a Denver type approach right. or a Seattle approach where there is a regional taxing authority right. um, that is the entity asking the voters to fund something that they're going to commit to build, building right. regionally instead of it being a local government asking for money to build part of something regionally. Right. One of the things that resonated I remember in the, on the Denver trip was someone talking about actually having t-shirts printed out with the entire regional map on the shirt as they were educating the public and they could point to exactly where their neighborhood was, where their city was. So, and I know there's some limitations now. Um, Steve, let me, let me sort of transition to one of the conversations you and I had after a meeting with Michael earlier this year about successful transportation solutions and corridors in Nashville. I asked you to put together a couple slides and we've got these points that you mentioned, but I'd love for you to talk about yep. th what makes a transportation corridor successful and how we can apply that to Williamson County. Sure. Well, first thing is, and, and it also ties on to the issue of, um, you know, what can we do differently in the future? How can we improve the process? One is we still tend to think too um, narrowly in, well, it's a transit project or it's a highway project or it's a 
sidewalk project or a bicycle project. And I think the more integrated we get, and I know we'll be delving into the South Corridor study in a mm -hmm. little bit, yep. uh, and saying, well, it's not one answer. Um, transit's not going to work in all instances. Private autos aren't going to work in all instances. Sidewalks aren't going to work in all instances. How the system fits together. But what I put together is uh, both from the feedback we got during the emotion process and frankly what we see in real life through the Regional Transportation Authority system is where we see it work well and where we see it work not quite, not, not quite so well. First, we start with uh, really solid places and talking specifically about the counties outside of Nashville, although it's, although it's true in Nashville to a degree in Davidson County, really solid uh, permanent purpose-built park and ride facilities. When we were able to partner with TDOT to do the exit 11 park and ride up in Clarksville, literally ridership on that service increased 35% within a month or two. Because uh, we had a well lit, safe, well marked, very well located permanent facility. Uh, in contrast, we've had challenges in other markets where we're behind the shopping center, behind the church. Um, the shopping center needs to build something new. We get bounced around, uh, and we've seen ridership decline. Predictability of travel time is important. When we talked to literally thousands of people during in motion, they said, sure, it'd be great if uh, the mass transit alternative were faster than my car. But the biggest concern we heard from middle Tennesseans in their commute was the unpredictability of travel time. I think uh, there's a general understanding as we grow that it's not going to take 10 minutes to get everywhere anymore. But the idea that, well, it takes me 15 minutes today, 45 minutes a day after that, an hour and 10 minutes. So reliability of travel time. And we truly see that on the Music City Star, which really doesn't have anything getting in its way. Um, it tends to perform much better on a productivity standpoint than any other RTA service, even though it's the fourth largest commute market in the RTA system because it operates 97% on time. And with all due respect to TDOT, we can't say the same for I-40 uh, in that <laughs> corridor. Um, yeah. That's fair. Convenience, obviously, is the frequency and the travel times. It's the number one complaint we get about the Music City stores. There just aren't enough trips to adjust to you know, changing work schedules and what have you. Uh, mentioned speed tied in with reliability. And a lot of people talk about amenities. They are important, the Wi-Fi, the plug-ins, the comfortable seats. But they're not going to drive ridership. If you can't get the items above that, um, if you have a lousy park and ride location and the bus is sitting in traffic, you can have all the Wi-Fi in the world. It could be 10 times faster than what you have in your office or at home, and it won't drive it. And the cost issue, I think, is important, particularly to this audience, as many of you are employers. It's not so much the issue that it has to be dirt cheap. It's the issue that it has to be at parity with the alternatives. So frankly, we had a number of employers uh, who were very supportive of the Let's Move Nashville initiative uh, in Nashville who subsidize employee parking in downtown Nashville, but don't participate, for instance, in the Easy Ride program. So the extent to which you can look at your businesses uh, and hearing what Nissan does right. with telecommuting options, what have you, very laudable. The idea of trying to you know, reach that parity, and that's where we see some real, real gains. Yeah, and uh, one of the things that struck me on the Seattle trip, uh, Michael, was how closely uh, the, the community worked with the business community and how they adopted some of these uh, transportation solutions as well. And we'll talk about that later in our conversation. So in about the uh, last 10 minutes we have, let's go ahead and jump into the Southern Corridor study. And before we do that, I'm going to put a map of barge, de barge design solutions. Paula Harris is in the audience. was kind enough for it to put together a map. I don't know, Michael, if you can see that or not, because I want to direct this next question to you. Um, this is, I think, from 2010, the daily traffic volume in 2010. This is the scary map, everybody. There is the model for 2040. Um, this, is, this is the MPO coming back up in just a second. Right, Griffin Scott, there you go. Right, so I mean, again, you know, these, it's, it's a map of congestion corridors and the percentage at which they uh, predict they will, they will grow in terms of congestion. So go back to this for just a second, this model I talked about earlier. So Michael, talk about what the Southern Corridor Study is, what it will mean, and then what happens after that? How do you, how do you put something in place after you, after you do, a, do a plan, right? I mean, I think that's the frustration too is that we spend a lot of time planning, not much implementing, how do, you, how, do you, how do you make that happen? Yeah, before I answer that question, think about these maps. I mean, I, what's 
really striking about the forecast for congestion is that not only is the congestion sort of worsening on the quarters that you're already familiar with, but it's spreading um, like a cancer, if you will, to quarters that are not congested today. So your solution about taking alternative routes or certain times of day to get around that congestion um, is going away in the future. Um, so that's the other thing to remember that this isn't just about you know, those main arteries that are clogged up today. But as far as the South Quarter study, this is um, it's a really, uh, really uh, good time for you all in Williamson County. This is actually the fifth major transit, I'll call it a transit study for now and shift my language here in a second, transit study we've done regionally since 2007. Mm -hmm. Um, each of these costs around a million dollars to conduct. Um, these are studies where we're looking at major transit investments, their routing or alignments or the technologies that we would use to um, deploy uh, the service, the schedules, uh, frequencies, uh, who it would connect, uh, what it would connect. Um, these studies are used to forecast ridership and cost benefit uh, and provides investor grade level information to make a business decision about what you want to move forward. Um, we've looked at the southeast quarter to Murfreesboro, between Murfreesboro and Nashville, the northeast quarter between Gallatin and Nashville, the northwest quarter between Clarksville and Nashville. Um, we've looked internally within Davidson County, the east-west connector, which became known as the AMP, had a similar mm -hmm. history. Um, but what makes this study different than all of those is that this is the first study that we are doing post enabling legislation to do something about it from a funding standpoint. Okay. So quite simply, the way I would describe this study is that this is your opportunity in Williamson County to work with your partners in Murray and Davidson County to figure out what you would put on the ballot if you were to choose to do that in three to four years. This will be defining the project and the complementary investments and policies that you would need to put into place to support that investment. So this isn't just a planning study that's gonna have a recommendation that sits on the shelf until such time you have the ability uh, to, to finance it, you have that ability to now to, to work through that issue now. So um, this is really, really tangible opportunity uh, that's in front of you. Now, in terms of uh, what we're going to be studying, I, I think you know the points that have been made so far are really important to keep in mind. And one of the lessons learned from the Let's Move Nashville campaign is that this can't be about transit specifically. This has to be about solving mobility challenges. And so we've got to look at the range of solutions as we're evaluating transit's role. Uh, in that. And if we only offer to the public um, two choices in any of these asks, the choices being, you know, invest billions of dollars in transit infrastructure or don't, then it's going to be hard to ever make that decision to invest the billions of dollars in transit infrastructure. But if we also include in that set of decisions, um, invest money in transit versus you know, toll every single highway uh, in Williamson County in order to generate um, uh, changes in travel behavior that's going to cut down on congestion or what other, whatever other alternatives are out there. Um, then we're comparing solutions and not just uh, do nothing or something uh, set of uh, choices. So, uh, quite simply, and I'd be happy to answer any other questions you have. This is a, this is an effort for you to define what projects would be going on the ballot in a couple of years here in Williamson County. And we've uh, recently, just to let you know where we are with this, we recently put under contract a consultant team that will be helping us uh, do this in partnership with the chambers along the corridor and the mayors that govern the municipalities and county governments. Um, that team is uh, led by uh, WSP USA, which is a, 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 a company, a global company that's planned and engineered and built and operated transit systems around the world. It's got significant present presence from local experts, including uh, Volker, um, which is in the room with us today. Um, uh, that's a global uh, planning, engineering, and uh, implementing uh, firm that's got a large corporate presence here in Williamson County. We're, we're excited to get started. Probably yeah. start seeing. Uh, this roll out publicly uh, later this fall. Finally, to the point about the South Quarter, I want people to realize this is a, going back to this idea of a, a continuum, this is a follow-up to the in-motion plan that was adopted by the Regional Transportation Authority two years ago. Whereas that plan uh, set um, included recommendations for the South Quarter, this study will help refine those recommendations and provide more specificity to it uh, so that investors can get behind the solution. So in just the last few minutes we have left, 
nearly 300 people in the middle of summer to time out of their day to come listen to a conversation about transportation. Um, what that says to me is this is a really important topic for our community. So what's the best way for people in this room and our community, one, to stay in touch, but also to give their input and ideas when it comes to transportation solutions? Ultimately, each person is going to own, whether they're an employer or employee. Well, I'll start with uh, really all the efforts to date. I think that's why partnerships with the chambers, other civic groups, other organizations are so critical. Um, whether it's Michael and GNRC and the MPO or myself and our group at the RTA, if we're going to host a public session, frankly, we get very limited attendance. We found the best outcomes when we partner with organizations that have built-in constituencies. I guarantee you, if I had put it, I don't care how good the food is, it was very good. Um, if we had put out an invitation, we don't have this turnout. So frankly, leveraging the resources in the community, whether that's business groups like a chamber or we've had great success uh, in Davidson County with church groups, religious organizations, educational groups, you know, you name it. So it's kind of starting in that pyramid at the top of, well, who can actually draw? Some of you probably didn't even know you were coming here for a transportation <laughs> conversation. You came because Matt asked you to come. That's, uh, and that's OK. That never works. You that know, never that's works. OK. That we'll never take works. advantage of that. So yeah. I think that's a good starting point. Okay. I, I think I'll just add, you know, besides following you on Twitter and Instagram, <laughs> uh, fabulous photographs. Thank you. Um, is, I think we need, need to do a better job of working through the people in this room. I mean. There's such a few number of people that work in government for these agencies that can get out and talk with folks. Right. And, and the, the reality is, um, the more there is a peer-to-peer -peer conversation yeah. about the value of these investments, the closer we're going to be to realization. Um, this has to be, I mean, you all have to be the advocates for solving traffic and transportation issues, whether it's whatever mix of a uh, highway versus transit and technology solutions are in that bag. I mean, it's got to be peer to peer more than anything else. And we're the supporting cast to provide you right. unbiased information to help you uh, help you come to you know good decision making. And, and is there a way for people to stay in touch on the corridor study specifically? It moves along. Is there some sort of mechanism where the public can kind of check in on it? Uh, we haven't launched the public face of it yet. We're still organizing. So I, I think what I'd say to that is just, you know, Williamson Inc. is going to be a pivotal partner in this um, and a spokesperson, spokes entity for, for this effort. Um, so following Matt, um, following the county government, um, and looking up the Greater Nashville Regional Council and following us, I think, is a way to ensure that you're, you're kept up to, to speed on the effort. Okay. Great. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us for panel one today. I appreciate it. Thanks, man. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Thanks, buddy. Good job. As we switch out our panels and we shift gears from talking about regional transportation to uh, talking about some issues that are more local, please turn your attention to the screen for a Channel 4 piece on one of our uh, transportation partners, Hitch, which was referenced a couple times earlier, uh, which is using technology to take cars off the road. And it's really at the forefront when it comes to ride sharing. Well, commuters across Middle Tennessee are jumping on a new trend during their ride to work, and they're earning some money to ride together using an app that's called Hitch Rewards, and that's Hitch with a Y instead of an I. H-Y-T-C-H. All right, News Force Rebecca Cardenas is live for us at Lipscomb University this morning. So, Rebecca, tell us about this, and what other incentives are people getting to use the new app? Good morning, Chris and Holly. So it's not just your ride to school. You can also get incentives for riding to school with your friends, not just to work. So look at this here at Lipscomb University. They've reserved more than 10 parking spots for students who are carpooling to school using the Hitch app. You can even see at the bottom of the sign there, they've got the link for you to go ahead and download the app. So not only are these students getting paid to drive to school with a friend, they get parking privileges. Hitch was designed to reduce congestion, congestion and emissions on our Middle Tennessee roads, and it does that by by paying a couple cents for every mile you drive in a shared vehicle with somebody else. That includes buses and Uber, so it doesn't have to be just be your personal car. The creator of the app tells me one of the coolest things about it is that it's building communities. People who have never spoken to each other on transit like the Music City Star, for example, have now exchanged phone numbers so they can hitch in big groups on their commute. I also asked the app founder about the transit plan that recently failed to pass. Here's what he told me when I asked him what's missing. What was missing? I, I can't tell, I can't emphasize enough. Incentives is what's missing. 
if you want to increase ridership, you need to think about incentives. I mean, just imagine an airlines program that doesn't have a frequent flyer reward program. There are none. So listen to some of these numbers. Since February, more than 1 million miles have been driven using this app, using Hitch. That's 90 days at about 25,000 miles a day on average. It's kind of crazy. It's a lot of numbers. So um, Andrew and I are actually going to hitch back to work, my photographer and me, um, on back to the station. But before we leave, I will get on Facebook Live on our main WSMV page, and I'll walk you through how you can use the app. It's super simple, and we'll teach you how you can start earning some money to ride to work as well. Chris, Holly? Sam Sounds good. Yeah, Ooh, if you're interested in doing it, jump on Facebook later. Becca will walk us through it. Thank All you. All right, Rebecca Gardenis. Great, and as it was mentioned at the end of that segment, there actually is about a 30-minute Facebook Live um, archive program that shows you exactly, for those who haven't used it or have interest, how you go step-by-step -step in using the Hitch app. Another one of our transportation partners that's been active over the uh, last several years to uh, help us solve some of these transportation challenge is the TMA group. And uh, I wanted to put together, or actually they put together a slide of just a couple of the things that they're doing. The group is doing a lot more than this, but I wanted to hit some of the highlights in the last year in particular. So you may have seen the van outside. Um, that is the van pool program. TMA runs the van pool program in Williamson County and in Middle Tennessee. They started 10 new van pools last year, added, and three of those were actually in Williamson County as well. TMA also manages the Franklin Transit Group. They doubled the amount of stops within the system for access improvement. They increased the frequency from one hour to 30 minutes to each stop. And then finally, something new for the organization is the School Pool is Cool program. I'm sure everybody in this room notices a huge difference between the summer months when school is not in session. And um, this is a ride matching program to take cars off the road to put more kids on the buses but also in carpools and um, they're actually expanding this program next year to five local elementary and middle schools. So Franklin is just one example as we move from talking about the region to more local. Franklin just one example of how all the six cities in Williamson County are working to manage growth in our community and there's great things happening across the county um, time limits us to, to just focus on Franklin today. So joining us from the city of Franklin, we've got Eric Stuckey, the city administrator, Kelly Danenfelser, the long range planning supervisor, and Paul Holzen, director of Web engineering. Thank you all for joining us today. Mm -hmm. All right, Eric, I'm gonna, gonna start with you. So, you know, this was mentioned in the first panel. When you talk about transportation, it, it's really more holistic now. It affects so many different things. So I think it, you know, one of the challenges in any community like Williamson County and Franklin is going to be about managing growth. This is a place where people you know, want to move to, want to be, consider this a land of opportunity. So talk to me about um, philosophy when it comes to managing growth and, and what sets Franklin apart from other peer cities when it comes to managing growth. Well, um, thanks for having us, and we're, we're glad to kind of hold the flag for cities and talk a little bit about what happens on the, the local level. Uh, really, planning is a huge hallmark of our success. It's, it's thinking through not just land use, but transportation planning, other key infrastructure. And having that plan and working that plan is really critical. And so success is not an, an, an accident. Uh, you plan for it. You, you look at how land use and transportation link. That's something we've put an extra emphasis on in recent years is to do that. One of the other things Franklin puts a particular focus on is, and this has been a, a philosophy our board has put a strong emphasis on, is that development helps pay its way. So we have probably the most developed impact fee system of anybody in the state of Tennessee. I'd put it up there with anybody. It, it's costly, but it helps assess the relative impact of new development and, and have, have that cost be shared. Uh, whether it's about roads, whether it's about water and sewer, uh, parks, all of those elements are considered in that in those formulas. And we look at what the relative share and impact is of that new development. So that's something that's been going on for many, many years and does help us share those costs more effectively, helps us plan on revenue that helps us pay for projects and get things done. So that, that's really a big part of it. Great. Thanks, Eric. Um, Kelly, next to you, is there a city that Franklin looks at as a, as a model for growth? Are there certain aspects of what other cities are doing that Franklin says, yeah, that's, that's either where we want to be or, or there's some lessons learned from that city in particular? Matt, we pull from a lot of cities from throughout the country. 
and we partner with Franklin Tomorrow and Williamson Inc. to go visit places that face similar challenges to what we face. It's really valuable to hear what other cities are doing well and also what they're not doing well. Um, it helps when we look at our own city. A few years ago, we had an expert come in from Missoula, Montana, and he showed us how they conducted a development suitability analysis to show what areas of their city were most suitable for development and what areas were least suitable. And our board and planning commission really liked that idea, so we enlisted the help of a consultant to do that for us, too. I think we brought the map. So this is the result of the suitability analysis that we had done. Uh, we used nine factors, including development constraints like floodplain and hillsides, and proximity to sanitary sewer systems, and proximity to existing fire stations and major thoroughfares, and came up with this map. The green areas, dark green, are the most suitable, and they're toward the center of the city. And then it spans outward to yellow and orange and red, which is least suitable. Some of that's due to environmental constraints like hills. Others is due to proximity to sanitary sewer. This became the foundation for Envision Franklin's growth and land use policy recommendations. The city, however, is receiving annexation requests in almost every direction of the city. Our plan calls for planned growth timed with infrastructure improvements, and we can't realistically, fiscally, responsibly grow in every direction at the same time. So the question becomes, how do we prioritize where that growth should be? And we've been looking at that over the last six months. Uh, we did a sewer basin study, or drainage basin, where the water flows, and looked at every basin around the UGB, looked at our ability to provide services, we looked at the overall magnitude of cost associated with extending services, like sanitary sewer lines and new fire stations in some cases, and we weighed that with the overall amount of developable acreage in each basin, so kind of a high-level return on investment. And then staff assigned a short-term, mid-term, or long-term annexation capability to each basin. Then we presented that information back to the board a couple months ago so that they could use that information as they consider annexation requests. The next major request is really out on the east side of the UGB, kind of where the word mid is down Murfreesboro Road. It's about 500 acres, and it goes before the Planning Commission next week for a plan amendment to support development on the east side. It's a very complex set of issues because now we allow non-contiguous annexation, uh, there, but there's substantial cost in extending sewer infrastructure and lots of road improvement projects that need to take place out there. So this will continue to be discussed as we move forward. How does an annexation request actually work? Well, the state law has changed in the past couple of years. So. Uh, and it limits cities' ability to effectively annex whole areas. So annexation can happen from a property owner request, or it can happen with a public referendum, which we haven't really delved into too much. So it's really up to the property owner whether they would like to be annexed into the city. And state law also changed after that to allow non-contiguous annexation, so, which means the land doesn't have to be next to city limits. It can be a satellite annexation. Okay. So strategically, yep. that's made it harder for us to do sort of a logical alignment with infrastructure. We're dependent on a property owner coming to us to say, okay, I'm ready to come into the city. And so it has changed a little bit of our, our ability to manage it on a more regional basis around the city and to align it with some of the infrastructure. So it, it creates a different uh, mechanism for us to work through. We're, we're still trying to plan systematically and logically, but it, it does change the rules of the game a little bit. Okay, that's good to know. And I think it's a great example of how you can't really separate transportation solutions from managing growth and how we do that as a community. Uh, the one question I know that's in everybody's mind, and if you want to learn more about this afterwards, talk to Paul. Uh, Paul, what is the latest on Mac Hatcher? 
What's the new timeline and, and um, why did the timeline change? Well, we were very excited about Mac Catcher coming. Uh, right now, <clears throat> we are finalizing acquisition on one remaining track uh, due to some uh, changes uh, with how it impacted the project. And we're shooting for the December 2018 bid letting and working very closely with TDOT to meet those deadlines. It's about a 2.75 mile project. Uh, the estimated construction time frame is around three years. That is still up for debate and subject to some change. Uh, it includes about a half mile bridge that spans the Harpeth River uh, in two locations. And this is, since I've been at Franklin, this has been our board's number one priority. Uh, we've invested around $5 million to really expedite the design and right away acquisition to get it to be a, a shovel ready project so that we could get it uh, in the funding list. And so uh, we've also been working with our, our development partner, Southern Land and, and the West Haven Development, to help fund a 12-foot wide multi-use trail along the entire corridor. Uh, what's exciting about this is it's gonna connect West Haven to uh, the intersection of 96 and uh, uh, Boyd Mill, and then that multi-use trail will extend all the way over to the Williamson County Recreation Facility, which just shows that not only are we looking at transportation, but we're looking at other modes of transportation and the importance of that in Williamson County. Great. You know, one of the ideas of having this transportation summit annually is a chance to sort of check in on projects and, and look at where uh, projects are headed to. So I asked the city to put together a, a map of the um, five most recently completed road or connectivity projects and also look ahead at the ones the city's focused on, focused on for the next 10 years. It's kind of an annual check in or physical. And if you want to run through that uh, PowerPoint now, that'd be great. So Paul's gonna run through some specifics, but let me give you a big picture. In the last five years, about $170 million worth of capital investment projects have been completed in the city of Franklin. About 84% of those are transportation related. Uh, when we look forward to the next five years, we've got in the pipeline probably twice that much in capital investments. So well over 340 million that are coming. Uh, a big chunk of that, about 130 plus million, is a, a wastewater treatment plant upgrade. Uh, and, and so that's going to chew up a big chunk of that. But the rest of that is, is a significant portion of that is really hitting the transportation element too. And Paul's going to walk through some specifics for you. Right. So running through some of those projects, this is the part I love because oftentimes we're thinking about what we need to do next, where we need to get the next project done. And we don't often take the time to look back at all we've accomplished uh, at the city to try to keep up and manage, manage that growth. And the first project I'd highlight is uh, McEwen Drive. This was uh, phase three, it was built in two sections. Phase three, the temporary connector was about a $9 million investment. It's about 1.25 miles of improvement. Uh, and, and McEwen Drive is such a critical connection to the city, to Williamson County, to the city of Brentwood. McEwen Drive is essentially gonna be that major east-west corridor that feeds the Cool Springs area and connects Franklin, it connects Brentwood, it'll connect the town of Nolansville. And so this was a big, big investment that we've made uh, and, and, and very excited to have that completed. Um, the next one is the Mac Hatcher Northeast Winding Project. That was funded 100% by TDOT. It was about a $25 million investment. And uh, that was completed in 2014. Uh, the next big investment was Carruthers Parkway South. Uh, that was a $2.75 million investment, I'm sorry, 2.75 mile project, $12.6 million investment by our board, funded 100% by the city of Franklin. And this is a great example of where we are targeting infrastructure improvements where we see the private dollars invested within our community. Uh, has one bridge that spans the Harpeth River. We built initially two out of the four lanes with plans to go back and build this as a four lane median divided arterial roadway. Uh, the traffic volumes are expected to go above 20,000 vehicles per day as this area continues to build out. And so we continue to look long term about the investments that we need to make as a city. Uh, next project is the Hillsborough Road project. Very excited that this project is complete. It was built in two phases, uh, phase uh, one and two. Overall, it was a uh, construction cost of around $23 million. And this is not just a roadway project. We rebuilt all of the storm drainage. We added sidewalks. 
We rebuilt all of the water lines, all of the sewer lines. We worked with Atmos Gas to replace all the gas mains. It was more of an infrastructure project than it was a roadway project. We worked with Middle Tennessee Electric to underground the electric to just really improve that gateway as you come in to the downtown area. Uh, the next project is our board of mayor and aldermen funded around $250,000 per year to fill in sidewalk gaps. The intent of this is where can we go into the city with little capital expenditure and really improve the quality of life and make a good investment. And so we use that money to target easy sidewalk projects where there have just been gaps for years. And we've uh, spent around uh, $1.6 or $8 million on this project. And our street department led the initiative to go into these different areas. We did one over on Oak Meadow Drive. We did a lot on Forest Crossing Boulevard, which connected the biggest, one of the biggest HOAs in the city to that commercial node up by State Route 96. We did South Royal Oaks. We spent around $1.6 million completing a sidewalk that connect Mac Hatcher um, into Pinkerton Park and ultimately into downtown Franklin. This is an overall map that just shows all the projects completed. That's that $170 million that Eric had referred to. And this is honestly, it's probably one of my favorite things to do is go back and look at how much we've achieved over the last five years. Okay. So what do, we, what do we expect over the next 10 years? I'll tell you that we were all extremely excited to see that TDOT has prioritized the Mac Hatcher Southeast Quad. Uh, in their three-year plan for physical year 19, they're, per, they're planning on moving forward with the environmental phase. And in 21, they're looking at moving forward with the design phase. We continue to work with them and stress the importance of this roadway. It probably has some of the worst peak hour delays at Lewisburg and South Royal Oaks, so we are extremely encouraged to see this project get prioritized by them. Our estimated cost on that project is around $30 million. Uh, the next drive is back to McEwen, next roadway is back to McEwen Drive, again, that major east-west corridor through Franklin, uh, through Brentwood, through Williamson County, over to the town of Nolensville. Uh, this is uh, funded, we received around $10 million from the National Area MPO through Federal Highways, and the estimated cost of the project is around $25.6 million. Right now, where this stands is uh, working on finalizing the environmental and moving into the uh, right away acquisition phase, which is exciting, and hoping to have this to construction by physical year 2020. Uh, this is a very complicated project. We're cutting the hill down around 20 feet, and the challenge is trying to, again, deal with utilities and keep those utilities live during that construction process. Uh, next project is Franklin Road, uh, essentially from the Harpeth River Bridge to Harpeth Industrial Court. Uh, it's it's an estimated $13.3 million cost, another gateway into our community. Uh, what you see here is an uh, investment on US 31. What's really interesting is working with the National Area MPO, we really prioritize as a county the importance of US 31. We'll talk about Columbia Avenue here in a second that we're going to make an investment on. You see us making this investment on US 31. And you also see with the city of Brentwood making a big investment on US 31 up by Concord Road. And so this project, again, includes a lot of infrastructure, water, sewer, gas, uh, storm drainage, an extremely important sidewalk connection that'll go from the Harlands, from the park at Harlandsdale Farms, downtown Franklin, where we have a lot of events. And it connects a lot of different uh, neighborhoods uh, in that area. So another, another great investment we look forward to. Uh, estimated to start construction in physical year 2020. As I stated before, uh, Columbia Avenue, uh, another big project targeting US 31. Uh, what we're looking at here is a five lane, taking two lanes of traffic and making it a five, five lanes of traffic or a five lane typical section. Uh, estimated cost is around $25.6 million. This one, I have to give credit, is fully funded by Federal Highways in the Tennessee Department of Transportation, uh, and we received that funding working through the Metropolitan Planning Organization. Uh, this is a very complicated project, a lot of infrastructure that we're gonna need to move, and so right now we're, we're targeting physical year 2022 to start construction of this project. Uh, another important part is to make sure we're talking about our, our pedestrian network, our bike and pet aspect of it. This is a, we received a grant through TDOT of about $1.8 million to construct a 12 foot wide multi-use trail down State Route 96. This connects 
multiple schools, churches, and subdivisions. You'll basically be able to walk from West Haven on a trail system all the way into downtown Franklin and around Mac Hatcher, so a very, very important multimodal connection for the city. Uh, it's an estimated cost of about $3.6 million in looking to start construction in fiscal year 2020. Yeah, that is a lot of stuff. I mean, that's, that's, that's exactly right. There's a lot of stuff going on. And, and it's, it's easy to complain and say the city's not doing anything, the county's not doing anything, no one's addressing this. Clearly, that's not the case. And it's evidenced by the projects you've done, the projects that you're planning. So as a resident of Franklin, I just want to say I appreciate that. But Kelly, could you kind of go off this and talk about how um, development can, can actually reduce traffic congestion, especially when it relates to the Envision Franklin plan? Sure. Uh, different land uses have different effects on traffic congestion. And we try to locate our more intensive land uses where our regional transportation system and our infrastructure can best support them. So that's our regional commerce area. And on this, on this Envision Franklin design concepts map, it shows up in purple. And it's along I-65 in Cool Springs and down in Goose Creek Bypass. Uh, this is our regional employment center. And it includes corporate offices, uh, shopping and dining experiences, hotels, data centers, and a more recent trend to mix in multifamily housing into that, to mix those uses. Because the more we can do that, the more we can reduce the length of trips from people from their homes to shopping and work, and maybe eliminate some altogether. Maybe they want to take a stroll to dinner instead of getting in their car and driving. So the more we can mix, the better we can manage congestion. Another way we do that is through the neighborhood, uh, neighborhood commercial areas, which are shown in red on this map. They're strategically located throughout the city in UGB to provide those neighborhood type uses. Maybe it's a coffee <coughs> shop, a restaurant, dry cleaners, things that you need on a, on a weekly, sometimes daily basis close by to residential areas and really focusing on connecting those through trails and sidewalks. Anytime we can strive for greater street network connectivity, local um, pedestrian focused environment, trails and sidewalks, we wanna do that and work with our transit partners and more rideshare opportunities and more transit to be able to give more options for people to use instead of getting in their car. Great, thanks Kelly. And that's actually a great segue. I said we're just gonna talk about the city of Franklin. That's not completely true. I was at a neighborhood meeting a few weeks ago now at Triune, um, just talking about economic development in general. And um, former mayor, current commissioner Beth Lothers was there too. I know Ken's here from the city of town Nolensville as well. And, uh, Beth talked a lot about um, connectivity and how that's played a role when she was mayor and now as commissioner. I'd love for you to take just a couple minutes and, and, and tell this group exactly what's happened in Nolensville and the role you played in, in, in doing exactly what Kelly's talking about from a connectivity standpoint. Sorry, thanks, Matt. Um, and starting in 2007, it was a challenge as Nolensville was taking off in growth when we had two lane country roads with drainage ditches adjacent to them. We had one state highway intersecting our historic district and uh, that was separated with a Mill Creek on one side and a tributary on the other. And so connectivity was a challenge. Now the town already required sidewalks in all new commercial development, sidewalks in all new residential. But what we did is we got very um, intentional in getting sidewalks in the old neighborhoods to connect to where the new Nolan's Elementary School was placed. So we applied for four Safe Routes to School grants, received three of them. That multimodal infrastructure was put in place and some is still in construction phase. We also got intentional trying to connect parks to the historic district. And we started applying for everything from Recreation Trails Program grants, multimodal, MPO. Thankfully, we received two major MPO grant awards. So now you can go see the Small Town Connections Project in Nolensville. You can park in the historic district trailhead, owned and operated by the town of Nolensville, cross over the bridge, and have a 1.1 mile multimodal trail 
that will connect you all the way to the Parks and Rec Center, the Nolensville Museum, the new Commercial Town Center. In addition to those efforts, um, Mayor Alexander was very involved with the new high school, Nolensville High School, Middle, uh, Mill Creek Middle, Mill Creek Elementary. He required those developers to create multimodal trails connecting to those schools. And Williamson County Schools did a terrific job on their internal pedestrian safe infrastructure. So now you're gonna be able to go from almost York Road and internal trails to Rocky Fork and then cross over and connect to the trail system. And a busy day in Nolensville, that's gonna be quicker than if you're in your car. <laughs> And we're um, fortunate to have Ken, as you mentioned, as our yeah. town administrator, who's working on the multimodal um, sunset road widening project currently. Right. So even small towns that started out country yeah. can uh, work toward connectivity. I think that that's a great point. And one of the things that uh, we've learned from talking to companies and looking at peer regions is how important connectivity is to the future of, econ of economies. And uh, as the millennials start to grow up, they're gonna look for neighborhoods and suburban location with great schools that are also connected. So it's great to see you know, the size of the city doesn't necessarily uh, dictate what you can do around these sort of philosophies. So thank you for, for bringing that, uh, Beth. I greatly appreciate it. One of the things as an organization that we supported, uh, along with a broad coalition of people, uh, was the Improve Act a couple years ago. So Eric, talk about um, the Improve Act funding and, and what kind of transportation projects it paid for in the city of Franklin. Well, it's, it's kind of hard to say what got funded because of the Improve Act, but we can say a lot of things were able to move forward. Uh, there's such a backlog, and that was a big discussion when that was being considered, but we saw things like Mac Hatcher extension, which had been languishing on that list, even though we had put well over $5 million of local money in it. That moved forward very quickly once that was approved. So there's been a number of, of, of state route projects, and most of our major roadways uh, in our community are state routes. So that's a critically important funding source for all of the cities. Uh, what we're also seeing, though, is an additional capacity uh, in, the, in the share, local share of gas tax that comes to counties and cities. Uh, that's a system us in Franklin alone, uh, we have about a million dollars more in our local street aid than we had a few years ago. We're using that to do additional street resurfacing and maintenance, additional sidewalk construction and maintenance as well. Uh, and so all of that adds up to help us, I guess I'm not working again, uh, to, not, uh, to, to be able to do those projects and maintain local roads. The other piece I'll highlight that, that we did locally, and this is about working locally, regionally, and statewide, is our, our board really stepped up and dedicated a dime of property tax, what we call Invest Franklin, to these types of major infrastructure, and, and seven cents of that dime is, is, is in infrastructure and transportation related uh, ex uh, initiatives. And so it's about taking control of it locally, it's like it's partnering with communities around you, it's working with the region, working with the state uh, to identify needs and prioritize needs and, and, and move it through and improve act and local initiatives like what we've done is what makes the difference. Thanks, Eric. And in just a few minutes we've got left for this panel. Um, Paul, I want to talk a little bit about the technology aspect and, and talk about the city's traffic operations center, how it incorporates technology um, in an intelligent transportation system. What does it actually look like and how does it reduce, tra reduce traffic in Franklin? So right now, the city of Franklin operates around 119 signalized intersections. And I don't know if you know this, but the state does not manage signals. It basically falls on the cities and counties to manage and operate those signals. Our traffic operations center communicates with around 88 of those signals. And what that means is every day when we come into work, we can run system health checks to see if detection is working, to see what has failed, to see if they are in time, in step, the signals are timed appropriately. And so it's a very proactive way to manage the infrastructure that we currently have in place. Uh, we also have around 22 cameras that when we implement new timing plans through corridors, we're able to monitor that and see how it's performing sitting in the office. We also go to the field and monitor those. Uh, we're fortunate to be able to do traffic counts at every one of our major intersections on a three to four year cycle. We can then turn around the next year with those timing or with those traffic counts and do new timing plans. And an office building opening up on 
Carruthers Parkway or 12 story office building, that can have a major impact on the cycle lengths or the length and times that people have to wait. And so we use this system to be extremely proactive, again, managing the infrastructure that we have in place. Where can someone get one of those stop like Christmas trees? <laughs> <laughs> that is not ITS, by the way, the tree. Okay. <laughs> that is not in City Franklin. Yeah. It's not City Franklin. Okay, we've got probably two or three minutes left. Um, any closing thoughts from, from anybody on the panel about transportation in general and Franklin and the region, how people again stay in touch, like what's happening with the Southern Corridor study? Any, any final thoughts from the panel? Yeah, I think they touched on it before. Being engaged, understanding what's going on in your community. There's, we gave you the example of Franklin, but there's outstanding planning going on in Brentwood and, and all the other communities in Williamson County. We're trying to work collectively uh, to, to make a difference and, and advance the projects that are going to have impact. But we can't do that alone. We need you to engage. Your voice matters in working with state officials, working with the region, working with giving us feedback so that we invest the dollars in the right place at the right time. So uh, just being engaged and understanding, and also understanding that really, uh, it's a, it, the all of the above approach is really the best way to go. You heard the mayor of Lone Tree say that. Because what works for you may not work for somebody else. We are also such an employment hub in the region that it's not just about how our residents get around. It's how the folks that work here get around. And if we can find better ways for them to get here, that makes a difference and impacts everybody's quality of life positively. So looking at this big picture and understanding that multiple options help us get better solutions and maintain quality of life is, is what I think is, is the, the best way to be thinking about it and engage, engage as you hear ideas and options floated about whether it's big picture or small picture. Having a plan, working a plan, but, but uh, engaging in that is important and having options is, is the bottom line. Great, anything else? Good, okay. Now I think that's a great point, Eric. Um, you know, if, if we get to the point when there is some sort of transportation solution at a regional level, even if you don't use it and somebody else does, that takes cars off the road for your commute to get easier too. So I think that's really important. There are multiple ways, there are, there are multiple avenues to solving these challenges and it, and it really comes down to individual behavior and decisions people make on a regular basis about how they get to where they want to go. So thank you all for joining us today. I greatly appreciate it. Thank our panel. <laughs> Thank you all. Yep. All right. Um, as, as, as Eric said, said and I kind of alluded to as well, um, we know there are multiple avenues to solving transportation challenges. Solutions will come from a regional level, a city level, and will come through individual decisions employers and employees make. This is a recent Harvard Business Review article focused on the flexibility expectations of employees. Really the bottom line to this entire piece is in the headline. 96% of US professionals say they need flexibility, but only 47% have it. This I think is the really important point. How they define flexibility in practice is critical to employee recruitment and retention, especially in a county with 2% unemployment. The companies that implement these strategies are the companies that are going to keep they're great employees long term, and that is really, really important. One of the things I'll just touch on, and actually this segues into what a company is doing here locally, is the idea of location variety and desk plus. Employees are based out of a company office, but they can, find, they can work at a location they're choosing for some portion of the day. Schneider Electric is a great example. We had a chance to sit down with some of their executives um, earlier this year. When their employees come to work, they come to work with a backpack and a laptop in that backpack and they find a desk, not their desk, they find a desk to work. So that's how they handle that piece. They also employ flex scheduling. Um, on this visit, the building manager said there's no reason for any of their employers, Snyder Electric, ever to be stuck in traffic because people can work at different location. And I asked if they're worried about employees taking advantage of that and they said employees are measured by how much they produce not by how much time they're in the building. I think that's really important as well. Another survey I'll mention here came from the business journals. When asked the question, what element of a work environment is most important to you? The top response was flexibility and technology for working at home at 46%. Our own Meg Hopkins has created a resource page that should be right there. Um, at our new microsites, it's williamsonchamber.com slash transportation. 
If you are an employer or employee, I uh, encourage you to go to this page to update and look at your policy and ways to fine tune your policy when it comes to mobility initiative. Meg did a fantastic job putting this together and, and like I said, these are employee recruitment and retention strategies. Speaking of employee recruitment and retention strategies, this week is International Take Your Pet to Work Week. Who knew, right? which has driven several businesses across Williams County to give pet-friendly offices a try. In fact, our office actually is a pet-friendly office on Fridays, and it's been really great from a culture standpoint and a play recruitment standpoint and retention as well. So we have Mars Pet Care's representatives right over there, in addition to other companies that are exhibiting here today, Hitch, FUDA, UPS Stores, and Federal Credit Union. Make sure you visit all these employers for discounts or for mobility initiatives as well. But um, you know, Mars Pet Care and the, the people that are gonna staff this when we're done can talk about how you can make your office pet friendly and give you some tips for uh, looking at doing that. Something else too I wanna point out, at your, um, at your, on your chair you should have, there should be a, a newsletter. That is not a current newsletter. It is a newsletter of all the history of transportation projects over the last decade. Basically, this is what exactly the city of Franklin was talking about, all the different projects that have been done over the past 10 years to show that progress has been made when it comes to rural projects, connectivity, and to public transportation. In addition to being a leader in our county's mobility initiative, another way we play a role in developing future leaders is through our Leadership Brentwood program. So I'd like to invite John Reedy at this time, he's the Leadership Brentwood Alumni Association Board Chair, to award our Youth Leadership Brentwood Scholarships. And John will bring a podium here in just a moment. Thank you. Uh, each year, the Williamson County Chamber Foundation, the Leadership Brentwood Alumni Association, and the Youth Leadership Brentwood Program present college scholarships to high school seniors who are graduates of the Youth Leadership Brentwood Program. Applicants for these scholarships represent the very top leaders and academic scholars in the Brentwood area. They are the cream of the crop. We were able to award four scholarships this year, and our first scholarship winner is Morgan Bussard, a Brentwood Academy senior. Morgan will be attending Texas Christian University in the fall. Morgan's mother Lisa and her father Mike are here today to help us celebrate her accomplishments. Would you please stand? I should have said stand and come forward, thank you. Um, I just want to say I'm so honored to be one of the students who are receiving this scholarship and I can't say how grateful I am to the Williamson County Chambers Foundation and the Youth Leadership Brentwood and the Alumni Association. As he said, I will be attending Texas Christian University this fall and I'll be majoring in biology um, on the pre-med track. Uh, I've always had a love for kids and love and curiosity in science, so I've chosen the career path of a bilingual pediatrician. Uh, thank you so much again for supporting my college education. Our next recipient, Adam Novak, uh, is a Ravenwood High School senior, or graduate now, who will be attending University of Southern California, and he's joined by his mother, Faye. Adam, would you come forward to receive your award? Uh, just to echo what Morgan came up here and said, thank you guys all so much. Um, I'm very grateful for uh, Youth Leadership Brentwood and what it's helped me uh, achieve and develop individually over the past few years, being a, a member and a mentor. And I'm very excited next year to move on to uh, USC out in California, fight on if there's any Trojans in the room. And uh, I'll be studying uh, computer science and business administration out there. 
uh, hoping to, to work with some entrepreneurship in the tech industry. So thank you guys so much. You know, being on that selection panel is an incredibly difficult assignment. We had uh, an amazing group of kids to choose from. I think we had nine kids to choose from, and uh, don't want to make that decision again, but these guys are the cream of the crop. Our next winner is Andrew Long, a Brentwood Academy senior. Andrew will be attending the University of Tennessee at Knoxville. He is uh, going to paramedic school in Columbia this summer and is not able to attend here today. Andrew's mother, Karen, and his father, Mike, are here today to help us celebrate his accomplishments. Would you be able to come forward and accept this award? Not only did he get out of this, he left dad with it. Um, <laughs> I think, um, I was thinking when he told me to come here, he is already starting his career. He wants to be a doctor, um, is attending, get it, he told me if I get my EMT, it helps me get into med school. So he's already started, he's gonna be a volunteer. So he's staying in state. Um, and I thought I might, I might cry because he's worked very hard. Um, and I see him study every night and he's a classmate of Morgan. And I can't thank this enough. This is for a kid that's not a, goes to Brentwood Academy and that's an athletic school. He's not an athletic kid. Um, to get honor for his hard work is, is very much appreciated. So um, thank you uh, to the committee. And our final recipient, Jackson McNabb, is also not able to be here today. He is debating at the Conference on National Affairs in North Carolina as part of the Tennessee Youth and Government Conference. He is also competing this summer at the National Speech and Debate Tournament in Florida and serving his term as the national president of Mu Alpha Theta at the National Convention in Colorado Springs. Jackson, a Brentwood High School graduate, will be attending Duke University this fall. His parents, Jennifer and Kyle, are here on his behalf. Jennifer and Kyle, would you please come accept his award? competitive family. Uh, <laughs> uh, Jackson did tell me to tell everyone here um, that he's grateful for the youth leadership in, uh, in Brentwood. It's helped him grow. For those of you that don't know him, first off, he's six foot six uh, and weighs probably 160 pounds. Uh, and when we toured the Duke campus, he was looked at and all the you know, other uh, kids over there were looking at him saying, you can play basketball? This kid has never played basketball in his entire life. <laughs> he is full on into academics. He wants to be the best he can be. He is going to go study biomedical engineering uh, at Duke. But this group here helped him grow. When he was a freshman, the boy hated to public speak, mm -hmm. despised it. Uh, he is now left here, and you heard it from here. He's, uh, he's actually in Fort Lauderdale right now at a debate, uh, national debate conference right now. And the last text I got from him was, Dad, I'm kicking ass. So <laughs> thank you all, and uh, thank you for him, too. Thank you. Well, thank you all, ladies and gentlemen, and please join me once again in showing these fine young leaders how very proud we are of their accomplishments. Thanks, Sean. There's, there's really no good way to follow that. That's, that's amazing. I, I, you know, I, first of all, I can't mention leadership. Brent would have not mention Lynn Tucker and the great work that she does day in and day out for that program. So, Lynn, thank you for everything you do for leadership. I, I, I imagine after being on the campus of MIT last year, for setting up one of our college uh, or high school programs, if you ever want to feel dumb, sit in one of those uh, uh, selection committees or spend a day on the MIT campus. There are some amazing kids in Williams County. Thank you, parents, for being here and the students for being here as well. That's fantastic. Um, thank you all for joining us today. I greatly appreciate it. If you are not a part of Williams Sneak and you enjoyed the conversation about an issue that's important to your business, 
and to our community, you're exactly the kind of person we'd like to have as a member. So please see anybody on our team afterwards uh, to, to get signed up today. Our next large event is the Business Expo at Mill Creek Brewery in Nolensville on June 19th. Thank you again for joining us and thank you for your investment in Williamson County through your investment in Williamson, Inc.